Performance Bike Scoop, our weekly show here at Performance Bicycle, where we talk about all the things happening in our world that we're excited about and that we want to share with you. Uh, today I'm joined by Mark. He's one of our product developers here at Performance. Mark, thanks for joining us. Sure, good to yeah. be here. Mark's an avid mountain biker, and today we're going to be talking about modern mountain bike suspension. Um, if this is your first time joining, again, thanks. This happens every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, we're also on Instagram Live right now, so uh, you can, if you're on Instagram, check us out at Performance Bike, and um, we also post lots of cool pictures on Instagram, all the things that we love to do. So anyway, um, so Mark, today we're talking about modern mountain bike suspension. Um, now, now we're not talking about like entry level flat bar path and pavement stuff, right? Yeah, we're not talking about hybrid bikes um, or department store bikes that have suspension that's really just there to give you a little extra comfort um, and not for any sort of added performance benefit like on a mountain bike. Right, right. So, um, so keeping that in mind, we're talking about modern suspension. Um, what is suspension? Like what is at, at its core and at its root? What is suspension for? Right, so why would you buy a full suspension mountain bike over a hardtail? Um, the main benefit you're gonna get from suspension is traction. Uh, it, like any other vehicle, be it a motorcycle, be it your car, um, if you can't maintain traction, um, imagine driving your car with no suspension, uh, it'd be awful. Um, be a little and, bumpy. And very dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's the, the main point of having suspension on a bicycle. Um, and then there are some extra added benefits, you know. Right. It, it is more comfortable. Um, and when you jump and stuff, you know, you get a little extra cushion landing. But really, it's mainly there for traction. Yeah. The, the front forks are not to just ram straight into a curb, right? Right. <laughs> it's not what they're designed to do. Right. It is for traction. And so some benefits of having extra traction are going to be, you know, you're going to climb a little bit better, right? Yep. And descend and corner, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to definitely climb better um, on any sort of a more technical climb with rocks, roots, um, anywhere where the rear wheel needs to stick to the ground, uh, it's gonna be more efficient. Uh, if you're just talking about a smooth fire road climb, then you know that's where a hardtail might have an advantage. Um, but then you have lockouts on a lot of shocks, so. Yeah, yeah. cool, cool. And there's a lot of different designs out there. You know, essentially as you're pedaling, the rear wheel just comes up because of the rear suspension, keeps the rear wheel on the ground as it's bumping around on those rocks and roots out there. Um, so Mark, what are the kind of like most common types of suspension? We mentioned earlier that we're not talking about like flat bar entry level. That's, that's kind of like basic coil springs, right? Yeah, so something like a hybrid or a department store bike is either going to have um, a coil, a, a real basic coil spring, um, which you can obviously, would obviously see probably with no adjustments whatsoever, um, or an elastomer, um, like a real basic sort of, you know, um, rubber spring. Um, but what we're talking about is um, what's on probably 90% plus of current mountain bikes is air springs and like our example bike here has. Cool. So let's dive into air springs, all right? So first let's talk about, um, you know, I guess the setup of it. So mountain bike season is right around the corner. Uh, daylight savings time ends this weekend or begins, I can never remember. Yeah, but the, an extra hour yeah, of daylight. Yeah, and the days are going to get longer, it's going to get warmer, the trails are going to dry up, and so if you're thinking about getting uh, a mountain bike, you know, definitely come and check it out. We got, we got plenty of stuff. So if, say you buy one, you get a new bike, what's the first thing that we want to do with the setup? Um, okay, so basically, um, for the fork and for the shock, your baseline setting is going to be your air pressure, and that's just setting it to your the appropriate amount for your body weight um, the manufacturers usually have a pretty good set of guidelines for um, a baseline for air pressure basically you want under your body weight the suspension to compress a certain amount that's called sag um, and on the rear we're talking about usually a range of say 25 to 40 percent depending on the use of the bike and how much travel it has and all that. Um, so you have an O-ring on the shock and you have an O-ring on the fork. And um, when you set up sag, you get the air pressure sort of where the manufacturer wants you to set it up. And that's important because that each one's a little bit different. Yeah, especially right. on the rear because um, due to the variation in suspension designs, and there's a bunch, um, Usually the, rec the recommend recommendation of the manufacturer is what you want to go with. 
to, to get started, and then you can fine tune it from right. there. Um, so once you get the air pressure um, a, a, with a shock pump about where you want it, you're going to slide the O-ring up to the top of the shock, um, up against the seal, sit on the bike, um, get, a, get your weight fully compressed on it. Um, if, you, if you bounce a little bit, you'll want to reach down and push the O-ring back up Start against over, yeah. the top and then just carefully step off the bike and see where it ends up. And like this shock has gradients on it and it shows you um, 20%, 30%, 40% with little gradients in between. So, you know, wherever it stops, if it rec recommended at 30%, it's pretty easy to get there. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd say that they've made it really easy. Like you mentioned, there's kind of the marks out here that show the percent sag that it's at. Yep. Um, the owner's manuals are like pretty easy, pretty intuitive. And we also can help folks in the stores to sure. help you set the bike up. So, you know, I, I think when I first started riding mountain bikes, I was kind of like overwhelmed and kind of like, um, you know, like anxious to, to figure out how to set up my sag. But it's really easy, I yeah. promise. Yeah, it's super if easy. You have a, if you have a shot that doesn't have these gradients on it, um, you probably still have an O-ring, and it's just a, a matter of measuring the distance right. that it travels. So, you know, if you know you need to get about 19 millimeters of sag, and you can just pull out a ruler and measure it. Cool, cool. Um, so let's talk about, so that's, that's set up, and sag is what it's commonly referred to, getting it set up right. Let's talk about um, adjusting air springs, because there's a couple of really cool features and benefits that you get with an air spring, like, like shown on a modern mountain bike, that's, you know, you don't get on this kind of price point basic stuff that are uh, some of the entry-level coil springs. So what are some of the adjustments that you can make on the rear shock or the front fork? Sure. Um, if you go to a, a bike shop and buy uh, a bike that has front suspension or front and rear suspension, you're pretty much guaranteed that you're going to have a rebound adjustment. Um, that's fairly standard. And rebound is the, the forks where the shock is going to compress down. Yep. And rebound is exactly what the word is it's when it pushes it back out yes when uh, a compressed forker shock ex extends back to its full extension um, that's rebound yep. and you want to control that rebound um, because as you go over bumps um, and the wheel moves up and down you don't want it to just freely move up and down you want to be able to control it yeah so, yeah, totally. <laughs> and so just about every fork and shock comes with some level of rebound adjustment, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, this dial, uh, this red dial on the shock is a rebound adjustment. Yeah. And, you know, it has a guide on here that shows you how to use it, but essentially you turn it clockwise and you add rebound damping, turn it counterclockwise, and you reduce rebound damping. And it's indexed, so you kind of know if you want to go two clicks, um, or three clicks and then go back a click, um, you, can, you can play with it and you're not just wildly turning, turning the dial. Um, on the fourth, you have a rebound adjuster down at the bottom. It cool. works the same way. Um, you know, turn it in, turn it clockwise, you add rebound damping, which slows down the rate at which it, it rebounds. Um, you reduce rebound damping and it returns faster. Cool. So you want to balance that. You want to find a fine line between those two where it's controlled um, and it's not bucking you and it's not um, compressing, uh, decompressing so slowly that, you know, it won't return before you hit the next bump. Cool. Cool. And, you know, you can get really close, I think, with the initial setup. And then you're always going to kind of fine tune it after your first ride, a second ride, right? I mean, the manufacturers have gotten really good about getting it super close, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, some manufacturers give you a full, a full setup. If you weigh this much, set the air spring right. at this rate and then turn the rebound adjuster this many clicks. Um, but that doesn't work for everybody, uh, and it may not be your personal preference. So it's best to use their guidelines and then go from there. Yeah, totally. So what about, uh, what about compression? It's kind of like one of the other adjustments that you can make on uh, some of these uh, air springs. Yeah, so you're definitely going to see more variation in what sort of compression adjustments you have based on the quality of the, the, quality of the piece of equipment or the brand. Um, but... Usually what you have, um, if you do have a compression adjustment, you usually start with a low speed compression adjustment, mm -hmm. which just kind of um, adds support to the fork or the shock. Um, so compression is just as it sounds, you're compressing it. Um, so as you hit a bump and you compress the suspension, the compression adjuster lets you adjust you know, how easily that's initiated. Right. 
Um, and on this fork, it has a low speed compression adjuster right on top of the fork, um, which is on top of the fork primarily so that you have easier access to it. Uh, the rebound adjustment's usually set and forget once you get it. Um, the compression adjustment, you often want to adjust it mid-ride so that you go from having, you know, a real active, say a real active fork that moves real easily into its travel to maybe a little more support as you're climbing a big hill. Right. Um, and then on the rear, you have, on this shock, you have uh, basically a two position switch um, that's either um, open or locked out. Um, and when I say locked out, it closes off the compression circuit so that um, it's essentially like a hardtail. You know, you, you, you lose some of your traction, um, which is good sometimes if you're just going up something smooth right. and you don't want the suspension to move up and down. Yeah, helps um, you climb. It's a little bit better for pedaling efficiency, right? If it's yeah, a long, yeah. long climb or something like that. Yeah, a long, smooth climb is great for that. Yeah. A, a, real, a real technical, bumpy, rooty, rocky climb, you probably want to leave the shock open so you get... Totally, totally. So what, you know, what happens if you, um, you've got either the fork of the shock locked out or turned all the way up with as much compression as possible. And you get to the top and you forget to turn it, turn it off or turn the compression back down and you just bomb down the descent. What's gonna happen there? Well, you're probably gonna notice it pretty quickly um, because it doesn't feel right. And if you don't notice it and you get to the bottom, um, you're probably gonna be kicking yourself for not, right. <laughs> for not doing it. But um, My chi flow was totally off down that descent. I was all over yeah, the I place. Mean, essentially it's probably it just, something wrong with it. Essentially, you just it's not working the way it's supposed to work. So yeah. um, you usually forget to do it occasionally and then you kind of get out of the habit yeah. you know, of forgetting. Gotcha. Well, cool. So that, that's great. We talked about sag and the initial setup and then adjustments, rebound and compression. What about maintenance on this type of thing? Is it, you know, on, on these shocks, is there something that you need to do at the end of every ride? Yeah. So again, when you go back to what the manufacturers recommend, they're going to have a maintenance schedule that starts kind of with every ride, you know, every three months or every excellent amount of hours riding the bike um, or miles sometimes. Um, and that's really helpful to use uh, as a guideline. But what I would say, what I do every ride is definitely wipe off the fork stanchion, wipe off the shock shaft, get the kind of um, dirt and oil that's accumulated on it, off of it, because it'll sit right on top of the fork seals. And, um, and it could kind of get down inside of it, right? And yeah, I mean, these, scratch it these, up. Are, these are designed to keep stuff from getting inside the fork, but uh, you know, a fine, grit of oil and dirt will definitely make its way in there over time yeah yeah so just keeping those clean goes a long way towards you know better suspension performance over time and you know um less maintenance gotcha Um, so talking about suspension over time um i guess each manufacturer has recommended a long-term maintenance schedules too right yeah so you know they have a little longer cycle for maybe just replacing um, the, the external seals and then an even longer cycle for a full rebuild um, where you send it back and um, or you send it to a tuner or the manufacturer they tear it down completely um, put new seals put new oil in it um, sort of reset the internals and, and send it back to you yeah um, it's one of those things that honestly most people don't pay real close attention to and go well outside of. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm an example of that, I'll be honest. <laughs> I, <clears throat> I had a season where I let it get it away from me and you know, the bike just started performing badly, yeah. essentially. And it was kind of like the, you know, the long, slow burn. I didn't totally catch on. And then once I got it you know, serviced, it was like a brand new bike for me. It was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's one of those things that you may not notice just how much it's degraded until you get it serviced and then uh, it's like a brand new bike again yeah so that's usually a pretty good reminder to to stay on top of it a little bit more cool so what um what's next around the corner is there any you know big exciting stuff We've, we talked kind of about you know basic coil springs and then kind of like air springs which is one of the most common things that you've seen there are like higher end coil springs uh new technology that's coming out right sure i mean when, when you're talking about coil springs and we mentioned them at the start as uh being on like the most basic uh, department store bikes. Well, you also find coils on downhill bikes. And this is an older version that we have here. Yeah, this is an old free ride bike that uses a, a coil spring shock. 
Um, and it's a, a good example. Yeah. Um, but basically, you know, at the highest levels of, of downhill racing, um, you see some air springs, but you see a lot of coil springs, and uh, those are those are just uh, they're more consistent over a longer descent where you get more heat buildup in the right. in the shock. Um, a coil shock is more consistent. Um, they're a little more work to get tuned to the to the rider, um, based because you change out coils based on your your body weight, and you, you might change out uh, the coil a little bit based on the terrain you're riding. But um, you're definitely seeing coils come back around on trail bikes, enduro bikes, um, because they're getting lighter, and people are looking for that performance edge that you get from a from a high end coil. So you will see more of those on you know longer travel trail bikes, enduro bikes, yeah, um, in, in the next year or so. Yeah, and also for air springs, you're going to see electronically controlled air springs. Um, yeah, this is. Sounds exciting, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what you've got is uh, an electronic uh, controller that's going to basically tell the shock um, how to adjust itself, open or, open or close, little little tiny adjustments as you're moving over terrain, just based on what the shock's doing. Yeah. Um, and that's that's in theory that's pretty awesome. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. Cool. Well, exciting stuff, Mark. Thanks so much for running us through modern uh, suspension. Sure, Appreciate man. it, man. Uh, if everyone out there watching, this is just kind of like one of the first ones. Again, uh, first videos that we're doing on mountain bikes. We wanted to start with suspension. Uh, later down the road, Bike Scoop is going to be talking about which type of bike should I get based on travel um, and more of like a geometry discussion. So we didn't want to jump into that today. We'd be here all day if we were talking about that. Sure. Yeah, we'll just tackle one topic at a time. Yeah. Cool. Um, Mark, thanks again. High fives. Yep. Yeah. And everyone, thanks for tuning in. Again, Performance Bike Scoop happens every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here on our Performance Bike Facebook page. So thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you next week. All right. Cheers.